Silent Hill 2 Remake is a really demanding game. I have found that you should only care about three settings. Shader detail, shadows, and ray tracing. These are the only settings that provide noticeable visual changes and a tangible performance impact. The rest are either too insignificant in affecting performance, or the visual sacrifices are huge compared to the performance they can potentially offer. So you're kinda better off leaving them enabled or at their maximum values. Okay, so let's start with the easiest setting to decide on, and that is shader quality. This affects the shading of objects, and while it does provide some performance gains, the visual trade-offs are too much for me. Like this car for example, turning down to low did give me around 4 to 5 frames per second, but the windshield has now turned completely black along with the car lights. Basically, objects that have full transparency properties will be heavily affected here. And let's move to the flower shop and we can see here that decreasing the shader quality to low or medium will provide almost a similar bump in performance but the contact shadowing of foliage gets reduced. Lighting quality of objects are affected including James's hair which now looks flatter on lower settings. The details on some foliage are lost and the quality of light passing through translucent glass is also reduced. In short, I recommend keeping the setting on high, but if you really want more frames, go with medium at the very least. Okay, so let's move to the second most significant setting and that is shadows. And this is where it gets really interesting as how shadows behave in this game is very tricky to pin down. At first glance, it's really subtle and finding differences as you stick to the main path will give you very subtle visual changes. In here for example, the visual differences between low and high shadows are practically undetectable, but the performance difference is huge. Same observation applies when you explore the town. The performance gap is there, right? But the visuals are virtually identical. That's why this shadow setting is very much worthy of our attention. Now you might say, this is a done deal. The comparisons are very obvious. Let's just use low shadows, enjoy the free FPS, and call it a day. But that's not as simple as you might think. And I've seen a couple of optimization guides out there that fail to fully cover this and they just simply settle with the obvious locations, the ones that you are walking around generally. But once you go beyond the beaten path and actually explore specific spots in the game, the visual differences are very much striking. Uh, let's go back to the very first area. There's a spot right there outside the bathroom that shows sun casted shadows. And this is where we will see the first striking difference. Turning down shadows to low actually disables the sun casted shadows. It's not that subtle anymore, right? This makes medium shadows more of a viable option now as it strikes that perfect balance between visuals and performance. Really, really interesting, right? So let's move indoors and shadow comparisons can still be subtle like this one. There is some slight degradation in shadow resolution as you go low, but it still looks largely the same. But once again, investigate further and more differences will reveal themselves. Uh, for this example, one can notice that shadow draw distance is also affected by this shadow setting. Notice how the folder stands shadow and the red panel on its right pop into view once you reach a certain distance threshold. And this gets improved as you move up the shadow values from low to high. Moving ahead to our final example here, this also affects the fidelity of soft indirect shadows. I really love this part right here as the casted shadows by these wooden railings kind of remind me of those baked shadows we would usually see in the early 2000 games. In this case, turning down the shadow values will decrease the prominence and compactness of these soft shadows. However, on its own, the low setting doesn't look that bad actually and still looks like it's kind of part of the environment. But 
when you compare it to medium and high, the low shadows kind of look more diffused and disproportionate to its source object considering the proximity of those wooden railings and also they look noticeably lighter. Okay, so let's move on from shadows and let's dive into the most significant visual setting in this game. And that is, of course, it's ray tracing. Once again, just like with shadows, testing on the obvious paths will provide you with very subtle results. Like this one in the first area with a white van. The visual differences are very minimal. The right side of the van receives a more accurate light occlusion. James' jacket is a little bit darker. And the trees in the background receive a shift in their shadowing. Also moving indoors, the differences can be very subtle. Like in the previous location we just tested the shadows in. It does get additional shading in some areas, darker shadows perhaps. But looking at this comparison, would you really sacrifice the performance gains you're getting for this type of image? To be perfectly fair, testing in the right location will reveal the visual benefits of ray tracing. Reflections is one of those. In here, traditional SSR on ray tracing disabled gives you the usual artifacts as source objects get culled away from camera view and using ray tracing, reflections remain intact and coherent regardless of how you move the camera. To be honest though, except for the breaking up of reflections, SSR in this example doesn't look that bad compared to ray tracing and it's really interesting to see. Okay, let's move now to another example. In this case, I think this is pretty clear how much ray trace GI transforms the image and adds additional life to it. Notice how outside light gets propagated through the windows, uh, how it appropriately lights the curtain facing the light source, and how light leaks onto the floor, bathing the room and objects inside with a warm sunlit glow. This is an instance where the power of ray tracing GI is really undeniable and becomes captivating. However, in isolation, ray tracing disabled doesn't look that bad again. In fact, it still looks atmospheric and grounded and seems like the time of day has just simply changed. And when you consider the drastic amount of frames that you're sacrificing, especially in some specific spots where the drops in frames is staggering compared to the visual difference you're getting, disabling ray tracing becomes more enticing, right? To further complicate things, the performance impact of adjusting shadows is very dependent on whether ray tracing is on or off. In this example, we can notice the usual subtle visual differences as we move through the shadow values, but take note of the performance gains. It's really quite minimal with ray tracing enabled. Compare this to when RT is turned off, the performance impact of shadows become more tangible and substantial. But what's even more interesting, guys, is that there are instances where ray tracing enabled actually ruins the image. Inside this RV, for example, there seems to be a glitch or whatever that makes RT enabled introduce distracting light leaks. And this removes all contact shadows, which further flattens this image. Compare it to RT disabled, it's really night and day. Notice how the contact locations between objects are more accurately shaded, like under the table for example, and especially above the windows right here. This could be fixed in a potential patch after its release, but at this point in time, on this specific location, ray tracing disabled provides a more compelling look, at least for me. Now, you might still say, oh, that's just a rare case. I still like to enable ray tracing as it gives me better reflections and GI lighting for the rest of the game. Well, hmm, allow me to welcome you to Woodside Apartments. This reception office area and initial staircase section is where the real fun starts. Even if we use the lowest preset that has all the settings turned down, but we keep just ray tracing enabled. The game will still drop a 3080 Ti to its knees and well below 60 frames per second. What's even more interesting is that switching to the Epic Graphics preset with all the settings maxed out, it only cost us 6 frames per second. 
this is telling us that something else, aside from the advanced graphic setting, is bottlenecking our performance. And of course, as you might have guessed it, it is ray tracing. Using that same example, disabling ray tracing alone while keeping the rest of settings at max using the epic preset now allows us to reach 60 frames per second on the most stressful areas in the game. This is why, for me, at this point in time, I recommend ray tracing disabled if your goal is to reach 60 FPS. The performance benefit is just more transformative compared to the visual benefit you are giving up. That's a lot of stuff for just a handful of settings. Before we wrap things up, let's cover upscaling methods for a bit. I recommend DLSS overall as it provides the best performance and visual stability using the quality preset. If you're an AMD user, of course, FSR 3.0 would probably be the best bet for you. But either way, what matters is how sensitive you are to image garbling, aliasing, or crawling. So just choose what's best to your eyes. Just be sure guys to download the latest DLSS DLL file using the links I'll provide down below and simply paste it to the location that you're seeing here on screen. I'm well aware of the engine that I and I tweaks shared online that supposedly improves the quality of ray tracing, but I will not be covering that one since part of my optimized settings is disabling ray tracing for performance. I also don't encourage enabling FSR frame generation in the config file because not only is the input latency so bad due to the absence of NVIDIA reflex to offset that one, but the image quality just looks far worse and abysmal to me. And based on my testing, all these band-aid solutions just create new problems, so let's prioritize our peace of mind and enjoy the game for what the devs intended it to be. But for those interested, I'll still be sharing those tweaks in the description down below. So, to sum things up, here are my recommendations for the perfect balance between visuals and performance. Number one, disable ray tracing. Then, select the epic quality preset and drop the shadows to either medium or low. And this guide, in this case, will choose low for maximum performance. You can also consider turning shaders to medium, but for me, I think it's unnecessary. Now, for the comparison. Let's go through the most intensive section that I've found and compare how our optimized settings stack up to the max default settings. Awesome, looks like we are now well above 60 FPS even in those problematic choke point areas. And if you choose to lock your frame rate at 60 FPS using RTSS, you'd get additional headroom for your GPU to breathe and rest. Don't forget, focus on enjoying this game because this is really a phenomenal remake of a classic monolithic title. I am really amazed on how they translated such an iconic game using modern technology. I love how the combat flows and is made more engaging and satisfying, yet still remain coherent with Silent Hill's themes the fresh take on these beloved characters that make them feel both new yet familiar, and then the expanded exploration that just flashes out the town and makes you more connected to it is just simply amazing. It's one of those cases where the remake of a classic title becomes another classic of its own. So that's it everyone, thanks very much, take care, bye bye.